Bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Good evening to all our English-speaking friends also. C'est un énorme plaisir d'être avec vous ici au sein du musée Cluny, le Muséum national de l'histoire du Moyen-Âge pour toute la France. To our American and English-speaking friends around the world, tonight we will, begin, we will be having this talk. We will be discussing together in, in, in French. The English will be available by simultaneous translation. The usual way you would pick your translation, uh, Céline, Carole, and Misha, our dear friends, three moderators tonight, will be collecting your questions in English and in French and answering comments in English and in French. They're very ready and from now on you will for our English speaking friends select the translation button for simultaneous translation from French to English here we go quel énorme honneur Christine de what a great honor to be here with you Christine in this uh, very magical and marvelous uh, set we are surrounded by a tapestry a collection of tapestries that is uh, that represents for me one of the biggest art of works for the whole art history. These uh, work of arts are here at the Museum of Cluny. I encourage you to come and visit these tapestries. Even if you did it once in your lifetime, you should come back. And you should also note, thanks to the movie that you just saw, you saw uh, new details that are more and more surprising to our eye. We could uh, spend the whole night talking about this work of art, but Without further ado, we could kick off with our conversation for tonight with uh, Christine Decatoire, who is the general heritage curator and works on the goldsmiths and silversmiths collections and the Western textiles at the Museum of Cluny and the Museum of National, uh, National Museum for Middle Age. She is here with us to work on uh, the um, Middle Age bestiary and the precious arts and to talk about it. So we will start with the three chapters of this presentation and then try to tackle your questions. So we have today not only Chrissy, but also so Celine, Carole, and Misha, and we will talk about the bestiary. What is the bestiary, the fantastic bestiary, the real animal between naturalism and still stylization and the symbolic animal? So what is the fantastic bestiary? The uh, bestiary is a book, a book of a collection of pictures of real and imaginary animals where we could find uh, a natural, real animal on one page next to an imaginary one. And here, as you can see uh, in the book that was uh, written by Christine, as she says very well, imagination is reality, as we can see in the uh, medieval art. And here in this conversation, we will try to see how this concept influences the art of work. So, here we will start with the unicorns. The unicorns, as you can see on the left side in this illustration that is uh, at the National Library of France. In this page, you can see well, the unicorn who is drinking from the uh, water of the castle. Next to it, we have the lion who is in the middle, who is looking at us. And then we have the deer, a dragon that is here represented as a pet, maybe a pet animal for the aristocracy back then. And then we have the crocodile with the head of wolf or a dog. So you get the idea here. With the bestiary, we have everything that is possible in terms of representation. Yes, the medieval uh, bestiary represents both real and fantastic animals, exotic and domestic animals. These fantastic animals are a true part of the bestiary art in the Middle Ages. Could it be for the representation of different animals, hybrid animals, composed animals? And also we can have hybrid beings with mid-human, mid-animal. Uh, 
animals like mermaids and centaurs. So here the unicorn is the star, as we must say, for the bestiary middle age arts. You can see it here in this room, a strong representation of unicorns. As you can see here, and the unicorn exists already in the uh, ancient times because back then these imaginary uh, animals used to exist in the imaginary world but in the middle age you should know that it has evolved such that unicorn is sometimes considered as the creation of the middle ages and uh, the unicorn here has a body of uh, uh, the horse and the feet of a goat and a small uh, tiny uh, beard uh, it is an animal that has several significations and meanings. It is uh, sometimes associated to uh, poison detection. This animal is uh, quite wild, that is uh, only captured by the virgin. It is a courtois animal, an animal of courtoisie. Uh, as we know in the courtois art and the courtois poetry. It is also an animal that has Christian representations with the Christian uh, meaning that represents uh, purity and even the Christ himself. And here you can see an aquamanil, which is an object that uh, contains water and it is used to pour water on a table. Aqua means water and manil me means hand. So it is an object that we handle by hand to pour water. And this aquamanil was created back then in the Germanic Empire around the 400 years and has a form of unicorn, but also has other animals. So you can see the big uh, horn um, in front, but also a small dragon that is represented here as a uh, handheld or the faucet that is uh, uh, used and represented as a dragon to pour the water and the small dog that is used to close this uh, faucet. So this is a very charming representation of the unicorn that is uh, quite familiar back then in the Middle Age representation. And here, the unicorn with the aquamanil is quite perfect because the sophistication that we had be before in terms of uh, washing one's hands during the banquet and talking about other uh, topics before the banquets, this was quite important. And today, we can also talk about the textile work that we have here, textiles that are quite uh, used and uh, uh, represented as real jewels that we could talk about. Here, for example, we have this uh, fabric. Uh, as you can see here, the condition is quite surprising. What are the kind of threads that are used in this uh, textile? So these are silk and golden threads that are used for this uh, uh, a piece of cloth. Uh, these uh, brown colors are uh, used to be golden threads that with time got brown. Uh, and this is probably a pillow. Uh, and on it, we have a representation of the unicorn and the green circles. And we have also another fantastic being, mid-hybrid uh, animal, that is the mermaid fish at the center. The mermaid has also origins from the ancient times with the uh, mermaid uh, birds, uh, as we know them the uh, companions of uh, Ulysses, as we know very well. But in the Middle Age, this representation is uh, reworked and it is represented as a mermaid fish 
that is a pure Middle Age uh, creation, invention, that has the, a tail that is divided in two, as we can see here on the central uh, part of the uh, textile. And this mermaid, could it be a fish mermaid or a bird mermaid? In the Middle Ages, it is often associated to vanity. And on the mermaid uh, fish that we can see here and the, the, these objects that are conserved here at the museum, we can see a mermaid that is looking at herself in the mirror. And this is a real representation of vanity. And this mermaid on this profane uh, work, it is properly identified and for those who have young girls we have this uh, strong link in relationship with the representation of mermaids uh, thanks to cartoons and on the left you have the representation of the mermaid and the unicorn on a ring this uh, representation uh, is uh, in this kind of uh, object, uh, we have the representation of uh, love, of beauty. But another item that is very important for us historians, uh, we have a popular jewel that was democratized back then with the profane representation, uh, symbols of uh, pilgrimage, uh, these uh, rings and kinds of objects used to be worn by so many people back then. And today, these objects uh, used to be produced at uh, hundreds of thousands of pieces because anyone could wear them. But we can see that these symbols could be represented in the most honorable and noble medals, but also in the more more popular uh, materials like the ring that we have here on the right. We have the representation of the unicorn that is a um, mainstream animal representation. This animal is touching a heart, as you can see. It is touching the heart. And this unicorn is made in gold and enamel. It is very difficult to create. And we have a lady on the other side, which is uh, a lady that incarnates the theme of this uh, room because this lady is touching the heart as well. And we can see that the unicorn is purifying the heart and it is showing that the heart is pure and it is a heart of love. And this is a Fides ring, as you can see here, the hands uh, holding each other below. This is a ring that represents and symbolizes the union, the engagement between two people, maybe even an engagement ring. So here in the most precious uh, metals, you have the same story that is being told. And the same case is for other uh, objects of arts. And here we can find other synchronicities in other kinds of uh, uh, supports. For example, in this uh, uh, Champlain, the Champlain that is called in French the uh, Aumonier, it is a small bag that we used to wear around the waist because back then the clothes didn't have any pockets. So we would hang a small bag on a belt around the waist. And this Aumonier, this uh, champ, uh, Champlain was worn by men. And this represents hybrid beings that are uh, animals and uh, humans. So you can see the upper body is a human and then the lower body is maybe a representation of a lion or a, an animal. So we have this representation in relief uh, with the golden threads with also uh, uh, woven in such way that we have this uh, uh, thickness representation and the uh, uh, also the characterization of these uh, characters. These three characters represent musicians. We cannot see now very clearly the uh, uh, music instruments, but we can see here a kind of uh, 
tambourine uh, where the music, musician is playing his uh, music instrument. And uh, these musicians, we can also see them in uh, other manuscripts. And we have the same representation of hybrid uh, beings. And now, because we are talking about music and sophistication, uh, this could be uh, worn uh, during uh, banquets and even events like this fountain that you can see here on the left side. We have uh, fountains that were used uh, during banquets, and these fountains used to play music and maybe Maybe had even uh, flavored water, perfumed water, and around the table we could have this fountain and at the same time discuss. And we have on these fountains, we have the representation of these hybrid uh, beings. And this is a real marvel of Gothic uh, architecture. We have a mixture of uh, gold, of silver, and enamel. And on them, we have the representation of uh, uh, hybrid uh, beings that are not only playing music, but also drinking water. So this object used to create this sound, uh, this very relaxing sound of water, and you will have a link where you could discover further this kind of uh, object, and this gives you a great impression of the ambiance that used to exist back then. And here, another fantastic animal that was uh, very present back then and used to be represented under different forms, it's the dragon. The dragon for the Christian uh, Western world, it is a negative uh, figure that incarnates uh, evil and sins. So we need to fight this dragon. And here we have the representation of a dragon stick where we have a dragon cross uh, with a dragon and snake scrolls, as you can see here, worked in enamel. And this dragon is being fought by Saint Michael. And here on this cross, we have a dragon that represents the whole uh, stick, but also within the same stick, we have small representations of other dragons, small dragons that are uh, intertwined. And in the socket, we have a decor decoration with three uh, small tapering dragons that with curved uh, tails. And we can see it very well. These, in details, these small dragons that are following uh, one another. So these uh, dragon crosses are quite uh, numerous back then in the Middle Ages, and we still have a lot of them. Like the uh, the cross is a, it is a symbol of dignity for bishops and abbots. And this cross symbolizes the uh, willing, the uh, necessity to fight against evil. And what strikes me always when I uh, see this kind of representation is that the dragon has always a kind of uh, advantage and it is bigger uh, than the saint. But here we have a kind of scenery from the modern uh, cinema uh, representations. We have this uh, scene of haunting and fighting, and this is very sublime. Uh, for me and gives us the opportunity to really focus on the sophistication of the goldsmiths and silversmiths back then. On the right side, we have a different dragon, two dragons that are facing uh, each other on a bracelet that used to belong to a member of the uh, Lord d'Or, and it was produced in the 14th century. This bracelet with a very remarkable goldsmith's work. What is interesting here is that these two dragons are in vis-a-vis -vis and they represent like the cause, uh, the engravement of words of uh, Allah, the word Allah, because uh, 
This was interesting because it is when the Grand Khan used to change the official religion of his empire into Islam. And this means that dragon can also be a positive image, especially in the Asian world. And you should know that dragon, uh, the dragon is a very positive animal in Asia, in the Eastern uh, world. And this year we have the uh, year of uh, dragon, and this is the opportunity for us also to uh, observe this very beautiful pieces of jewelry where we have here on the right side these two dragons that are uh, playing and trying to hunt and to chase the uh, pearl of flame that is the representation of uh, knowledge and uh, uh, happiness so the dragon here is the happiness uh, symbol and on the left side we uh, have a jad uh, work of dragon and here you should know that jad is a very uh, fragile uh, stone and this is a, a very beautiful work of art and even if the dragon is uh, positive in uh, in uh, Asia, in Europe, we still had the representation of uh, the dragon, of uh, the bestolette, which means in French, uh, les petites bêtes, the small monsters, small creatures. Uh, these are small uh, dragons. Uh, the word bestelet is uh, very present in the sources. So these small dragons are either uh, real animals or vegetal animals because sometimes they have a human head or a vegetal uh, tail. Uh, the, this is a strong representation in the Middle Ages, uh, both for religious and profane objects. For example, here we have the uh, dragon that is... Uh, uh, engraved in a monstrous and on this object we have the dragon representation that have a very uh, a pure decoration role although it has this uh, negative uh, signification of uh, the dragon in christian civilization but at the same time it has a very strong decorative dimension and uh, this is also uh, used in, the, in these fermai, uh, the uh, object that used to uh, close the uh, the coats back then. And here we have the representation of dragons with the Gabriel uh, Archangel and the uh, and the Virgin Mary, we have the representation of dragons on uh, red or blue enamel, and this is a real Parisian production style of uh, enamel back then in the 14th century. So the quality of this enamel and the uh, super the superposition of uh, these uh, figures is very interesting, and it is quite surprising to see how they are well um, mixed. So it has this size of 16 centimeters. So please, if you have the opportunity to come to the Museum of Cluny, please come and see uh, with your own eyes the quality of the enamel work, because right after this course, you will be able to appreciate live these work of art and please seize the opportunity to come and see this exceptional work. And again, here we have the uh, triumph of enamel. Uh, enamel work is very difficult to create. And here you have two jewels from the 19th century that represents the main figures of the Middle Ages. So we have the mermaid and the unicorn that still are at the center here for example we have the mermaid but uh, is represented in pearls uh, in uh, baroque pearls and she is holding the mirror here represented in a diamond 
And it is here in Cluny, you can come and see it. So again, the same story here is being represented with the mermaid looking at herself through the mirror and the splendid ornament of her body with pearls and uh, enamel. And on the right side, we have the unicorn that is traveling through the seas. And on her back, we have this traveler that is uh, traveling with the unicorn. So you still see this representation of the images of these fantastic animals that are very inspiring. And now we talk about inspiration for this uh, socket. Uh, this uh, socket is one of the best uh, sil sil uh, silk work that we have here in our collection. This is a pontifical stocking uh, that used to be uh, worn by uh, during religious uh, ceremony. Although it is not quite religious, it is quite profane because it is a, um, a, a very luxurious um, clothing. This sock was uh, transformed by the Cardinal Arnovia that was uh, back then appointed in Avignon. And we have found this uh, sock in Avignon. And here you can see clearly the Oriental Eastern influences uh, with these animals that are uh, one above the other and they are separated by small uh, decoration items. Here, for example, we have two ranges of animals. We have one first range of gazelles and the second range of fantastic birds. And it is interesting because you can see here uh, from the bestiary uh, culture how real and fantastic animals are well mixed in the work of art. And in addition, on the gazelle, we have a small dragon that is riding its uh, back. So the gazelle here is uh, embroidered, embroidered in a, a silk, green silk, and golden threads and back then it was much more shining and below we have these fantastic birds with a, a circular item at the center that brings to light the uh, quality of the golden thread and we can see how strong the influences uh, can be because Eastern influences with these invented animals can uh, be seen in the uh, treasure of Doxus, as we know here in Afghanistan. And we have also this bracelet that exists at the British Museum that recalls these uh, Eastern uh, influences that come from the 16th century. And on the right from the 19th century, as we have uh, discussed, uh, this, is, this was made by a Parisian uh, jewel. It represents a nice dragon. And he probably uh, got inspired by Oriental uh, dragons, but also Middle Age dragons. And of course, we have Asian influences that are directly shown on fabrics as uh, this. And starting from the 14th century, we have Chinese influences that are more and more significant with uh, uh, trades and between the Western world and the Eastern world, and also thanks to explorers, traders uh, like Marco Polo. And here we have a very beautiful piece of textile that is a big fragment that represents phoenixes that are chasing small birds. Here the big birds are the phoenixes that are trying to uh, eat and hunt small birds. And below we have this kind of lion that comes out from a crown of uh, fire and that is trying to hunt small animals. So these items represent strongly the Chinese influence and the Chinese art that is coming more and more into the Western world starting from the 14th century. We don't know if, if it was really made in Italy or elsewhere. 
And now we will fo focus on the phoenix. The phoenix is the symbol of the empress. Um, 200 years ago and even more, we have this piece of art that is a, a headband that used to be worn by the uh, women in the uh, Song dynasty. And this uh, symbol of uh, uh, women uh, is part of the Meng Dijuan collection. Uh, and here you can have the opportunity to go see this object in Dubai uh, through the exhibition that is called Golden Treasures. But we can see that this phoenix seems to directly fly on the head of the person that used to wear it. And it is clear now that the influences from Asia are very strong and are part of the uh, Western art and uh, culture. So now we have seen real animals, uh, very stylized animals, and now we will go even further into uh, depicting the heraldic animal. What is the heraldic animal? It is the animal that we see in the coat of uh, arms. These coat of arms are born in the 12th century and they are uh, developed within the Middle Age uh, society. In the 14th century, uh, the heraldic animal, like the Roman animal, uh, comes much later and it is much stylized so that it, it, you can easily recognize the uh, in a battlefield who belongs to which side and here for example we have the emblem where we have the eagle that opens its wings that are decorated here with gems and a pearl uh, on the head. The, the eagle here is represented in a background of flames and the flames are the rep is the representation of the Bohemian house. Uh, this is a relic uh, object because we have this uh, relic representation around the jewel and probably this object was ordered by a very important uh, character and uh, uh, person. We suppose that maybe it is the King uh, Charles IV that used to be the emperor of the Germanic Empire and probably had ordered this uh, very important object that has uh, very clear uh, ornaments here with pearls. And here the uh, relics here are around the, the crown. You cannot see them anymore, but back then we used to have uh, pearls. It is fascinating because this really shows us the triumph of imagination and creativity, creativity, as well as the level of precision and work. And on the right here, we have a fair mile for the Empress Giselle of Sabia. And here we can see the transition between the Roman uh, fibula and the fermile of uh, the Middle Ages. And here you have the incredible work of enamel uh, that is done as, it, as if it was a mosaic. And this used to be worn by fabulous, fabulous uh, women of the Middle Ages. And Again, uh, focusing on the link between textiles and uh, jewels, here we have on the left a textile that is considered as a jewel. This is a, an item that is uh, used as a horse caparison, uh, probably ordered because we don't have the specific dates, but probably commissioned by Edward III of England. And this was probably uh, realized in uh, before 1340, uh, probably by a craftsman that used to work by for the king. And the work uh, is very extraordinary. 
So as you can see, this uh, uh, fabric used to be uh, worn by horses with the representation of uh, three golden leopards uh, on a red background were the arms of England. And here you can see the detail of the uh, the leopard that are represented with the uh, oak leaves and foliage and also other items of representation such as the eyebrows, the eyes that are very much characterized. And around these leopards, we have small uh, male and female figures that create this courtly universe on the red background. And this uh, shows a very strong contrast between the red and the golden color of these uh, figures. So we imagine this horse was very important and we imagine how this caparison uh, could make it until today. And here, we think that this uh, gift was uh, given by the uh, King of England to an abbey, and this textile was transformed into a chair uh, cloth because this was de-restored in order to uh, bring back its uh, shape and to also retrieve the different uh, items, different fragments. We still uh, see the form of uh, the chair. And on the right side, the uh, left side, the right side, sorry, we have a ring that has engraved on it to my friend, and this is probably an engagement ring. It is part of a uh, treasure, a collection of uh, uh, rings from the treasure of Colmar that you can have here at the Cluny Museum. This treasure was hidden in Colmar by a member of the Jew uh, community uh, back then during the plague, because back then the Jews were persecuted um, by uh, other people during the plague. So what they used to do is to hide their treasures and wealth. In the book where we have the this ring, it is, it is in this book. And without knowing, I loved this book. And I used to read it during uh, COVID-19. And I would have never imagined that a few years later, I would uh, meet the author of this incredible book. So these treasures are here at the uh, Cluny Museum, like this uh, Champlain, this uh, Aumonier. Uh, and here in this Champlain, you have the representation of the swan and peacock. And this chaplain used to hold the money to do charity, although you can uh, wear other things within this chaplain. So on this one, we have... Uh, a stylize, stylization of animals with the swans and peacocks that used to be woven in gold on backgrounds that were in gold as well. And this used to form a series of small animals that are linked with small leopards. And here we did the challenge between jewels and textile, and we have found two jewels, one popular jewel because it was a part of an aristocratic family of a peacock that is probably, uh, that dates from the 14th century, uh, that is made in uh, uh, bronze. And on the right side, we have a very precious jewel that used to represent the high jewelry work 
uh, of a swan that comes from France, probably. Uh, the English say it's either French or English, but I am sure that it comes from France. And uh, on here, we have the uh, this object that used to belong to Henry V that is made with enamel and gold. And this uh, swan was discovered very recently. And it is precious to have both jewels and textile that come until our days to be able to study them. So it is uh, usual to see fragmented uh, textiles, as you can see here. This is uh, related to the problems of conservation and curation and also some uh, collectioners back in the 19th century liked to cut out these uh, textiles. And here you can see two pieces of fabric that were created in Luc. And on the first one, we have a series of animals that are represented in a more natural way, because back then in the Gothic era, we used to observe animals and represent them in their most natural form. And here you can see animals that are uh, hunting and eagles that are hunting. Uh, for example, here we have a, a, a green silk representation and gold thread representation. On the other fragment, though, we see a series of animals. Here, for example, a lion that is hunting uh, here, and this is a strong natural representation. And below, we have women under palm trees that are uh, holding a dog with their leash. And this is probably the domestic representation uh, of uh, wild nature and domestic nature. So all of this is represented in these very sophisticated fabrics that you can see here from side to side with the representation of uh, lions. But we couldn't resist the temptation because here you see an enamel golden work of these uh, four uh, emblems of lions. And this was created in the 19th century in the MoMA Museum in New York. We see this beautiful work of enamel and gold with the heraldic representation of the animal. So between stylization and naturalism, we have some animals that are very symbolic and very important. Yes. And also we have this small dog that you can see on the left part that is very naturalist. We have a very strong natural representation here. And it is part of a uh, belt, a belt that is not complete anymore, but still it is uh, represented to be to have this very natural posture. And at the center, you have this very small, beautiful jewel. It is is uh, a badge that used to be uh, sewed into clothes. And here we have a, a figure that is riding a horse and has a falcon on his hand. And here the horse is represented in a very natural way. Uh, and who is uh, and where we observe the real animal and not the stylized animal. It is a real animal. And on the right side, we have this emblem of Talbot. And you should know that objects were either functional or sewed uh, on clothes. And this used to be uh, worn to show that you were part of the Talbot house or related in a close way to the Talbot house. And anyone was able to identify this dog. This dog was introduced in England by the Talbot house during the 14th century, and they use it as their emblem, the symbol of uh, um, 
loyal animals uh, and because Talbots were very well known for their battles uh, back then and I know in France we do not talk about this but still we had a strong representation of these uh, uh, animals and here for example you have the mold that was used uh, to produce these Talbot dogs and you can come and see them at the Cluny Museum but still we can see the work that that was uh, uh, done to create these emblems. And here you can see the nature of the uh, dog's race. And we can go even further until we can use the uh, skull of an animal to create a jewel. And here, for example, we have a marten head. We have the the mouth here, where below we have a part of the skull that was inserted in a uh, uh, copper head, a golden copper head with eyes uh, made of glass. And this marten head used to be uh, sewed to a fur. And this was quite recurrent back then in the Middle Ages, uh, between the 15th and the 16th century, to have these uh, strong furs with uh, animal heads, more particularly the uh, marten heads, because the marten used to symbolize fertility for women. And you have, of course, uh, much more precious marten heads with uh, gold, uh, silver, the silver and also gems and other heads that are much more modest like we see here on this uh, image where we have a work of golden copper so it is modest for sure but dramatic as well so the symbolic animal and we will talk about this in our third part of the conversation uh, the symbolism of the animal can be both religious and esoteric. Yes, for the Middle Ages, the, both for men and women back then, uh, back then the bestiary had a symbolic meaning. And most of all animals had a very specific meaning, and this is why we have the concept of bestiary. And the medieval bestiary is uh, quite uh, dual, where we have a positive bestiary like the tetramorph uh, with the symbols of uh, evangelists. We have the lion of Saint Mark, the bull of Saint Luke, and the eagle of Saint John. And this tetramorph is uh, often represented around a majestuous Christ, like we see here on these uh, uh, work of arts that are of very high quality, made of gold, and we have the representation of a Roman uh, Christ uh, made in the at the end of the 12th century, where we have an enamel work that is very rare, uh, enamels that probably come from Limoges or Silos. So you have to come and see this uh, with your own eyes. And this is a very beautiful piece, one of the most beautiful medieval Roman uh, enamel work. And here you have again the representation of the dove. The dove, which is a, an animal that represents purity, but also the Holy Spirit. And these doves, like this one, used to uh, to hold uh, hosts. This is an, a Eucharistic dove, and they were hat hung uh, uh, in the church because they used to recall the Holy Spirit. And this one that we have uh, has moving wings. So mainly they were made with a copper and enameled at the wings 
and the tails. And the wings could open. Yes. So, yes, the wings used to open and we can uh, open them. And this recalls the flight of the dove. And the size of the dove was bigger than the regular natural dove. And on the right, we have the uh, engraved uh, copper uh, dove work where we have the expression and representation of the victorious Christ. Uh, and we also have the griffin symbol, symbolic. The griffin animal is uh, well represented in all, uh, in the whole medieval uh, art. And it doesn't have only a positive aspect. So yes, the uh, griffin has both the positive representation, but also the satanic representation because it is a an hybrid animal it is the uh, incarna incarnation of the Antichrist. And on this uh, uh, chaplain, you have the Aquamanine of the griffin. We see a griffin that is running and is dragging a woman on its back to her loss. So the griffin here has a very negative uh, signification. It represents the evil or the devil. But because the medieval bestiary is binary, and a lot of animals have ambivalent significations, the griffin also can remind the double nature of uh, the Christ because it has this, this double nature. It is both an eagle and a lion. And the griffin also is represented as a protection animal, as we can see here on this metal. And we have the strong representation of different animals for both protection and both um, uh, negative representation. And you can see here a very beautiful piece from Van Cleef and Arpels, the griffin here that has a protective uh, role. And this is a jewel of today, a unique piece that has this positive representation of Griffin. And to conclude, we have this very strong theme of uh, the fight between the uh, good and uh, evil. Here, for example, you have the uh, uh, dragon cross with the lamb that is representing the Christ that is winning uh, against the uh, dragon and uh, the lamb is holding a cross and here the lamb won the dragon and the dragon here is represented into three forms. We have uh, a main dragon that is uh, swallowing another dragon and below the big dragon we have another third small dragon so this uh, fight against the evil is represented by this victory of the lamb and this reminds the role of the bishops to uh, their responsibility towards the uh, worshippers and I love this kind of work because you can see here three dragons that are hunting a lamb that is not afraid. So it is impressive to see this small animal, the lamb that is standing with strong courage against the dragon. And again, we have a series of other popular uh, objects and jewels such as the lamb, here that is represented in very high jewelry work and here the lamp is uh, represented with a pearl and on the right we have another pearl that is representing a lamp the Agnus Dei the lamp of uh, God that exists in the British Museum so we have the lamp that is uh, holding a cross and is resting on a Bible. So now we will finish with the marvelous treasure of Doni that is here at the Museum of Cluny until the 20th of October. 
And this is one of our uh, best exhibition. Uh, here we have the exhibition of the treasure of Wanyi that was uh, uh, landed to the Museum of Cluny. And this exhibition will end in October, so you still have time. And this treasure has goldsmiths works from the 13th century, uh, mainly from uh, relics. Uh, realized by a, a great uh, goldsmith, uh, Hugo Doni, who made objects with items like these small animals and small beasts, uh, small creatures, but also real animals on hunting scenes. As we can see on some objects, we sometimes even have scenes of uh, hunters who are uh, chasing and hunting for deers or for uh, gazelles. So we have these uh, scenes of uh, hunting and also the representation of small dragons, but also symbolic animals like the dove. Here we have a dove relic that has at the center a very beautiful amethyst. So these uh, objects come uh, from Belgium. They are leaving Belgium for the first time of their lives, and they are here in Paris for the three next months. And what is amazing is that Hugo Doni it was not the commissioner, it was the goldsmith himself. So this is a very mysterious story. But for us, the jewelry historians, it is interesting to have the identification of this uh, craftsman. And in addition, we have this beautiful objects that are here. So it is uh, very interesting and impressive to read the story of these objects that were able to make it up until today. And we will conclude now, like we started, with this tapestry behind of us, Mon Seul Désir, my only desire, where we see our unicorn, that is here represented as a pet, a very happy pet. And at the center, we have this lady that has a cassette, a box where we have a, a river of uh, jewels, pearls and gold. And the pearls back then uh, were the most expensive jewels. And we have this representation of pearls in several ta tapestries. So what is happening here with these jewels, these sapphires? We can also identify this penals. What, but what is she doing? So this tapestry celebrates a happy wedding with the five senses and the representation of the sixth sense. And here we believe that this tapestry incarnates a happy wedding and she is discovering her sixth sense, the sense of giving, the sense of feeling. And Next to her, we have a crypt of Van Cleef and Arpels of uh, 1848. And we would imagine back then that the designer and the artist, the, the craftsman behind this uh, jewel, came to the museum and saw this tapestry and imagined a unicorn that would come out from this tapestry and would represent for itself a jewel. And this, I believe, was a beautiful way to conclude our conference today. And I seize the opportunity to think, to thank uh, our team and to maybe answer uh, the questions that you may have asked. The unicorn, has it been considered as a mythology uh, creature or was it already considered as a mythology uh, creature during the Middle Ages? Well, I think this started at the end of the Middle Ages. I think that these fantastic animals become more and more mythological figures. And this is 
stronger after the Middle Ages. And we see here today, even with emojis, we send a lot of unicorns in our uh, messages. And we also have unicorns uh, stores for children. Yes, we have this uh, interest and uh, enthusiasm for unicorns recently. So how do these uh, treasures how these treasures survived French Revolution. So this is complicated. It depends on which uh, objects we're talking about it. It is interesting to use the example of uh, uh, treasure of Oni. This was hidden during the French Revolution. It was uh, hidden by the latest, uh, the latest uh, a uh, guard uh, of the uh, uh, treasure in a uh, in an abbey uh, and because religious uh, establishment were dismantled during the French Revolution in eight, in the 1800s this treasure was still hidden in a farm during more than 20 years and in 1818, it couldn't uh, go back to the abbey because the abbey was not was destroyed, and therefore it was uh, given to the Notre Dame en armure. And often these objects uh, escaped from destruction thanks to the uh, their destiny. And we should know that a lot of these objects have been destroyed. Contrastly. And it is interesting to see how uh, these uh, objects uh, were made of gold. And it is uh, true that a lot of these objects were uh, stolen and used to uh, make gold. And you should also know that other than the French Revolution, we had other episodes of destruction uh, because simply they were out of fashion or because they were uh, melted for war purposes. And you should know that, for example, in England, uh, the reason why we didn't have these uh, glass windows, it, it was because a lot of people destroyed the glass windows. So all of these episodes of uh, events uh, made the destiny of these uh, objects. So what is the significance of the clear uh, pink color of the uh, fermai? Well, we analyzed the fermail and we found out uh, through the study of uh, several gems on the fermail. I don't know uh, exactly what is the uh, gem uh, that has the gold, the, the pink color. What, what we could say is that the pearls are very sublime and uh, interesting for the pearls at least. And we want to know why the golden threads uh, get brown with time. Well, this question is interesting because what are the golden threads, what we call golden threads in a textile? These are uh, threads of silver, silver thread uh, that are enrolled by an, a golden uh, thread. So at, uh, at a certain time, the uh, golden coat will disappear with time. And also, we have organic threads that come from intestines or uh, internal parts of animals that are enrolled with a golden thread. And thanks to that, the, the golden color fades away with time. So we do not have pure gold on the threads. And even pure gold is never 100% pure. We always have a mixture with silver and other uh, material. And this is why Paris used to have a, a very good reputation for its gold that was the purest. And 
what were the centers for embroidery in France and in England? Well, in England, it was mainly London. It doesn't mean that we didn't have any splendid work of embroidery elsewhere, but we saw it mainly in abbeys and in monasteries and also in cities. So in England, of course, we had some monasteries where we used to have embroideries, but also in London, in the city, we had a lot of work. And in France, we had the center of embroidery that was Paris, but also in other cities. And for example, in Italy, we used to have Florence, that was a very big center for embroidery, but also in other areas of the country, in monasteries. So we could continue and talk about this topic the whole night, but the museum has to close now and we will continue for the next time and we encourage you to come visit the museum and to join us for our upcoming conference uh, Thursday the 18th of July, where we will talk about the world of minerals. So now we have all of these campuses in the world. We have the new campus that will soon open in Dubai and we'll have this, the first exhibition on jewels of uh, French comedy. And I know that a lot of you come uh, to visit and we have the new library that is being inaugurated and you will have the opportunity to discover the books that were presented to you during this conversation today. We also have the new campus in Shanghai, Dubai, and this beautiful campus in Hong Kong. And I think that we will see you again very soon in one of those campuses and maybe we will continue here in this museum but i know that personally i will come back another time to take more time and enjoy admiring this tapestry thank you again for your work and for the whole team of this marvelous museum of cluny